Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Physics Problem Solving with Captain Hook. Today we're going to talk about an accelerometer, and a, a very simple one at that, and how it works. Um, we do have a four-port problem that's going to go with it, so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, just like always, you can see this video, or below this video, you can see the problem itself and what we're going to be doing. Uh, but we're going to go through it part by part. So we're going to start with what an accelerometer is. It's a device that measures acceleration, just like a speedometer measures speed. It's easy to build one of your own. It consists of a ball and a string hanging from the roof of your car. When the car is stopped or cruising at a constant speed, the ball hangs straight down. But when it's accelerating, uh, the ball hangs down at an angle, which we'll call theta. So real quick, we're going to go ahead and just draw a picture of what it looks like. So what we want to do, if we have, we'll just come up here. Imagine like this is our car. We have a string. This right now, we'll just have it hanging straight down. It's fine. And we have a ball on the end of it, okay? And when the car is not moving, or moving at a constant velocity, it's gonna hang straight down. But when it's accelerating, so we'll say positive in that direction, it's gonna look a little bit different. So this is the positive acceleration, or acceleration in that direction, which we'll call a positive x. We have a string which is actually gonna go something like that, because it's gonna be pulled backwards. And again, there's our ball. If we're I don't like using the word decelerating, but if we're slowing down, our acceleration is negative. We're going to have the opposite, so I'm going to go ahead and do that over here, where we have our string going down at an angle, and again, ball like that. So that's just the basic idea of an accelerometer. Okay? Now, part one says there's two forces acting on this ball. One is gravity, obviously pulling the ball straight down, and we want to identify what the other is and sort of just draw a quick free-to-body diagram. Well, so. We have, obviously, here's just gonna be our part one. We have our ball being held up by a string. So in this case, we'll sort of go at, it doesn't really matter which one we draw, but we'll go up like that. There's our string holding it up. Now, we know that gravity is pulling it straight down. So we'll go ahead and say gravity is pulling it straight down. Now, what is keeping it up? Well, there's nothing, it's not sitting on anything, so we don't have a normal force pushing it back up, but it is connected to a string, right? So that string is actually what's holding it up. So I'm just gonna say that's our roof of our car real quick. So we have a force of that string, it's called a tension. So we'll call it F of T. So that's the second force that's acting on our ball, is the force of the string or the rope holding it up as gravity pulls it down. Now, if you notice, gravity is always gonna go straight down our tension force, the force of our string or our rope, won't always be straight up and down. If the car is not accelerating, it will be, but in other cases, it's gonna be at an angle, okay? So, guess I got a little ahead of myself, but it asks for part two. Uh, do the two forces add up to zero? If not, in which direction is the net acceleration, okay? Well, since the car, and therefore the ball is accelerating to the left, in this case, with acceleration, uh, the net force can't be zero since there is an acceleration. There must be some kind of force pushing it to the left or pulling on it to the left. Since there's no vertical acceleration at all, the ball doesn't move up or down basically, the vertical forces must sum to zero. So the up and down forces or y direction forces must be zero. So one of the forces of our tension has to have a horizontal component. There's no other forces to cancel it. Therefore, there must be a net horizontal force. So there's going to be a force, a net force. So there's going to be a net force horizontal, which is not going to equal zero, but our net force vertical does equal zero because obviously the ball isn't like flying into the air or anything like that. So pretty easy so far, just a couple pictures. But part three says it wants us to write down Newton's second law for both the horizontal and vertical directions. Uh, you have to use sine and cosine to compose one of the forces into its components. So this is a little bit of trigonometry, which we haven't really done much of, but I think we can power through it. Okay. So again, since the tension force has both a vertical and horizontal component, let's first break it up into its components. So let's move this out of the way, and we're going to break it up into its components. All right. So if I just draw the tension force, which is going to be, again, something that looks like this, the force of tension, it has its two components. It has the force of tension in the x direction, 
in the force of tension in the y direction just to keep it simple okay so if our angle theta is up here we're gonna have to use sine and cosine well the force of tension in x which is over here is simply just the total force of tension times sine of theta our force of tension in our y which we will get to is just it's very similar it's just total force of tension times the cosine of theta so that'll give us our two components so if we were to add up all our forces we know that our vertical force has to be net force has to be zero while the horizontal force is just its mass times acceleration okay so let's do our vertical forces first so we know that our net force up and down with gravity has to be zero. So that's force of tension in the y direction minus the force of gravity, which equals force of tension in the y direction minus mg, which again, if we going with it that's force the total force of tension times cosine theta minus mg so we're not doing any numbers we don't know about numbers or anything yet just giving us equation okay now for our again that was in the up and down or the y direction for our x direction we know that in this case, it's going left, so our, it's going to be negative ma, because negative direction, equals our negative force of tension, because again, it's going this way, in the x direction, which again, if we want to simplify it a little bit, negative ma equals negative force of tension total times, which we already said, sine of theta. So this just gives us a brief equation on how we're solving, or what we, what we know. Okay? So part four says that you now want to try out your new accelerometer. So you get in your car and you hit the gas. As you accelerate, you notice the ball hanging down with an angle of seven degrees. So that's important. So how fast were you accelerating? Okay. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to use these two equations we just created. So I'm going to go ahead and move this out of the way. Just rewrite those two equations real quick so we can see them. Now the zero equals the force of tension times cosine theta minus mg. And we also, and again, that was for our y direction. And for our x direction, we know that negative mass times acceleration equals negative force of tension times sine of theta. Again, just rewriting what we've already done, okay? So we don't know the mass, we don't know the force of tension, and we're trying to solve for acceleration. So we gotta sort of do, combine, combine these two equations to get rid of what we can. So if we take this second one, now we can rewrite it a little bit, we're gonna reorganize it a little bit so that it, we solve for force of tension, okay? So we're gonna take this and divide it by negative sine of theta, so we get force of tension equals ma over sine of theta. And if you don't know the negatives, when, when you divide them, we cancel them out, okay? Then we're gonna plug this back in over here. So we know that we still have zero equals, well, we plug in ma over sine of theta for the force of tension over here. So ma over sine theta times cosine theta minus mg. So we've got one equation now, and if we divide by m, because so that's got an m and that's got an m, well, zero divided by m is going to be fine, so that actually, we just divide that out, so we don't care about that, so the mass doesn't matter at all. We're left with zero equals a times cosine theta over sine theta 
minus g. So we can now solve for a and do plug and chug. Well, if we subtract g to the other side, divide by cosine over sine, we're going to get a, again, a little bit of algebra, is equal to sine theta over cosine theta times g. Yeah. Okay. We subtract that over first and then we divide it. So sine theta over cosine theta is actually tan theta, but we can leave it like it is because it doesn't really matter. Well, we know our theta from our problem above was seven degrees. So that's just sine of seven degrees over cosine of seven degrees times 9.8 meters per second squared. Give us an acceleration approximately after rounding of 1.2 meters per second squared. And that's how much we accelerated to make the ball move seven degrees.